what's going down everybody welcome back to another episode of commander ad populum together we are commander for the people by the people for the people my name is ryan this is episode 34 and we are back post joey schultz from edh rec cast interview big thanks to joey for being part of that it seems to have been received well so i'm happy to have joey back and any other member of edh rec cast i'd like to complete the whole set i've already been talking to dana roach so Give me your quick hits on Discord if you're part of the Commander Ad Populum Patreon family, or just hit me up on Twitter at CadPopCast if you have any quick hits for Dana to answer. I like doing those, and they seem to be well-received as well. Got a couple community topics this week, but before we get to it, big thank you and shout out to FusionGamingOnline.com. They, of course, are the official sponsor of Commander Ad Populum, and you can find all of Fusion Gaming sponsored content over on TheManaBase.com. I mentioned the Patreon. Big thank you to all the patron supporters and big shout out to Dana Roach and Dan Kraus, two friends of mine, content producers, content super fans, and of course, good luck to Dan on his recent move. He recently moved and I've been kind of picking his brain a little bit about if he's all unpacked and settled. I know that that's a, a major undertaking and he said that Louisiana is quite distracting and that's where he moved to. So of course... All of the major stuff is unpacked, but the the office where the work's got to get done sometimes is left to last. So big thank you and shout out to those guys and to all the supporters. I'm going to say merry early holidays as well. I'm recording this kind of in the middle of December. This is my third podcast of the day that I've recorded. So if the voice is a little hoarse, I'm sorry. It's my wife's Christmas party tonight, so of course I'm on vacuum duty and I had to pick up 100 limes and a bunch of cranberry juice and, you know, a bunch of doctors and therapists coming over from the health region and and I'm out here vacuuming and doing all the the house cleanup stuff. I had to fold the futon up by myself in Studio CCO and that is no small undertaking. I tell you, if I was any less of a man, I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself, but here I am. My wife is upstairs baking cranberry bliss or whatever she was making, so... Anyways, today's community topics, I say topics because I have two, I have two kind of half subtle stories about some, I want to say creators out in the greater Magic the Gathering universe. The first one, friend and follower of the show, his name is Anton, I don't know his last name because I've never asked him, but he is the writer, curator, producer, content creator over at allhailbolus.tumblr.com. So this is a blog where he talks about the social aspect of Commander. And he contacted me saying that him and I have very similar outlooks on the format, stance on the format, general gameplay philosophy by the sounds of things, and social philosophy as well, as do many of my guests. So he wanted to reach out, and I would encourage anybody listening to go and read his stuff. He's got a whole bunch of stuff on the spirit of the format and the social contract and and kind of his interpretation of of how to play and the rules and why certain rules are in place and i think it's a there's a lot of stuff here that looks like there's an actual pretty good amount of information if you were looking to introduce somebody who's new to magic which we we like on commander ad populum or anybody who's new to commander if they're coming from a more competitive or air quotes real format if they are coming to commander and they want to bring that spiky mentality or that willingness to win this would be a good place to go and again all hail bolus one word dot tumblr dot com and it's going to break down kind of what it means to play commander. I think that's super important as we head into 2020. We uh, we had a very successful 2019 with the adoption of rule zero and kind of the divide between competitive and casual commanders and our willingness to talk about that and not shun the CEDH players and not make the casual players feel bad that they, that they play uh, jank, I'll call it, right? So this is a very good place to Put some of those ideas into newer players' heads. So link will be in the show notes, of course, and it'll be in the Commander Ed Populum community spotlight. So check it out. It's uh, there's a lot of content. So if you like longer reads or many different articles, then he talks about the ban list. He talks about repetitive gameplay, less variance, tutors, all that kind of stuff that is important to a fun Commander environment. So big thank you to Anton for sending that in and being part of the greater Commander Ad Populum family. Second kind of pseudo topic for this episode, I want to talk about 
my friend Brian Canada. People might recognize that name from the YouTube channel Cure for the Common Game or at Cure underscore Game on Twitter. Again, links to all that will be in the show notes as well. Brian Canada's goal is to build a commander deck for every single legendary creature that exists. And he sent me, I've heard his story before because he's been featured on, I think, Commander and MTG where he talks about, you know, does every deck have a soul ring and how does he store all these things and where does he keep them and how does he catalog it all? He's He's gone through all of that and he breaks, oh, he's gone through all of that on, I'm pretty sure it's Commander and MTG. I'll tag them in the community spotlight and they can probably shed some light on that as well. In his story email, I call it a story email because it's pretty long. To me, he says that he approaches it from the mentality that staples don't exist and he wants to build theme decks around different story elements that the that the, that the legendary creature might have attached to kind of their their character or maybe all basic land dot deck or what have you, right? Like every deck has a theme and that's how he keeps it varied and non-redundant. Not every deck has a soul ring, like staples don't exist. So if you kind of remove yourself from staples, it allows you to use cards that are off the radar, he says, or it allows you to introduce players that he lends the decks to. It allows him to introduce them to the, 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 the wider breadth of magic cards and magic history. So super cool project. He says that every second day he has to build a deck and release a video every second day. Otherwise he'll fall too far behind. He's already playing catch up at however many decks he's got. I know that he said the last time I, I heard him talking on whatever podcast he was on hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. And he's got like special deck boxes or deck shelves that hell that house all these different decks and there's hundreds of them you can see pictures of them on his youtube channel so i encourage everybody to check that out it's amazing so he says that he has been blank since 1993 his daughter born in 94 has grown up with the game her entire life and he used to own a local gaming store and that's where his daughter met her husband through magic. So again, this is like our, our third week in a row where we've got an entire family who gather around a kitchen table or an LGS to play magic with each other. Now we're including husbands and Brian is a grandpa because these two people, his daughter and her husband, have a kid and he calls him baby Jace on the channel and that's because his real middle name is Jace and some of his first experiences were with magic were were being handed a, a basic island and said read this and he goes he goes basic land island and being jace brian has actually built an entire commander deck themed around jace in the ixalan land with the the wandering little jace in it is the land that's in it for example it's like all jace themed which is totally cool because it is literally his grandson's deck and that's the kind of thing that just it brings a smile to my face that to know that that kind of thing can be accomplished within the game it's like the ultimate customization which is super cool and crazy and now that his grandson is is getting older, in the email, he says he's six. And he says that magic as a family activity has actually encouraged his entire family, all four of his kids, and now his grandson that he can read and write and do math. He says magic has actually encouraged them to do better in school because if you want to play magic with the family, you got to learn how to read, you got to learn how to write, you got to learn how to do math because if you don't know how to do those, you can't play magic because reading, writing, or I should say reading and arithmetic are sort of foundations of the game. They are part of what allows us to be critical thinkers and without those skills, you can't play. And that's encouraged, he says, four out of four of his kids and now his grandson. So I thought that that was a super excellent way to tie the last couple weeks into the next few weeks moving forward and beyond where we're including all of our families and we're building theme decks and multiple decks and staples don't exist. And believe me, every black deck of Brian's for on Cure for the Game doesn't have a demonic tutor, right? So there's going to be variation and, and little redundancy, especially if he's building theme decks and tying into our first topic of, of 
of allhailbolus.tumblr.com with Anton, that's the exact kind of thing that he's talking about as well. So here's two people out in the magic community that you can go out, read, watch, listen, consume their content, become a more well-rounded player if you've been in Magic or Commander for a while, or if you have new players, these are two excellent resources that you can say, here, new player, check this out. This is what it's about. This is why, this is some of the reasons why this is such a great format. So check them out again. All the links will be in the show notes and they'll be tagged in the community section on Twitter. I'd like to move on to, I'm going to call it a technical section, but I'm going to lean on to what I was just talking about as well, just after this. Okay, for today's technical section, like I said, I'm going to lean on to our last topic just a little bit, but I want to start off by saying in a game, it's okay to sometimes leave a little bit of value out on the table. We don't always need to find the max value, the most optimal line of play. We don't always need to do that. Magic is a game of imperfect information, so... A lot of the time, I'm not going to say most of the time, but a lot of the time, it's impossible for us to verify or or know without any doubt what the most optimal play is. Most of the time, we're operating on best practices, previous experience, assumptions, a tell that a player might have, or in, in some lesser situations, maybe a dropped card, a takesies backsies where you know something's in their hand. And under extremely rare situations, you know, somebody's playing with a telepathy or somebody, you know, is playing against a send triplets where, you know, the center, the send triplets player made somebody else reveal their hand. So we know what's in it, right? Barring those last few extremely rare scenarios, we are operating on information that is incomplete. It's not like chess where we know and can see all of the the board at the same time and we know what all of the rules are. In Magic, we just know what all the rules are. And sometimes we don't even know what all the rules are. Even if we did, some cards break the rules. And if our opponent has one of those in their hand, then it could change the the entire outlook of of an interaction, a turn or a game even. And what I'm going for here is that it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to go off of that gut feeling or that best practice and have it work out okay and sometimes it's okay to go off of a a a gut feeling or a i'm gonna just try and swoop in and steal the win maybe with an alpha strike instead of holding back in reservation because you don't want to get blown out by a sweeper or what have you some of that is my own kind of player preference showing through where I like that high variance or high risk, high reward magic. I like to overextend in an aggro deck and swing in for the fences. If I get blown out, then I get blown out. I'm also a graveyard player. So if I get blown out, probably I have a way to get some or all of my creatures back. And that's part of the reason that I'm overextending. I would encourage players to make plays that they think are fine plays based on experience and best practices. And don't beat themselves up if it was a mistake because you might not have known it was a mistake. You might have just went on a feeling or you might have made a decision on the basis of hoping they don't have it. And if they do, well, they just do. And that's the kind of thing that you can discuss with your friends or the people that you're playing with post game. Sometimes that comes from in games. Sometimes that comes from the build process. Okay. I didn't want to have six tutors in my deck that found me that discard outlet for me to discard my crater hoof and then tutor for my reanimate to get it back. Like that is a little bit too specific of a path to victory every single time. And like, for example, that's the kind of thing that my Hogak deck wants to do, but I explicitly avoid that line of play because I don't want to have the tutor redundancy in there to find me the whatever else I need redundancy because I don't have that optimized line of play in my deck. I have to be okay with overextending and hoping that there's no board wrath or 
underextending and politicking or holding up my own whatever it is, Golgari charm to regenerate a couple of my guys that are dying to bad blocks in the hopes of there will be a wrath in the future that I can get a little bit more value on. So like, I guess don't be scared to make mistakes and remember that in game, sometimes things have to fall apart for better things to kind of fall into place. Over time, if you pay attention to those things and if you... If you talk to players post game about, you know, this is what I did. What did you have in your hand? Was it justified? This is what I was trying to do. You're going to start to learn and get a feel for and know what the best practice is for these random situations where you're worried about gaining or losing value and never knowing if you're accomplishing that. So again, all just fancy words and kind of dancing around the, the notion of don't be scared to lose a little bit of value. Don't be scared to overextend into a wrath if that's the way that you think that you have to kill an opponent. Play to your outs. And sometimes things have to fall apart for you to learn what the best way to stack them back up is. So that's the technical section. No real rules interaction, just some stuff to think about. And remember, if all else fails, just go all in because ultimately that is a fun way to play Magic. Trust me. Up next, we're going to take a look at Nemesis. Okay, here's a little bit of a continuation of the nosedive that is Mercadian Masks block. Nemesis, released on February 14th of 2000. That is Valentine's Day of 2000. Excellent. Takes place on the Plane of Wrath, which is, I guess, sort of important. It's part of the whole Weatherlight saga where the, where the Weatherlight kind of escaped to Mercadia, but now we're back on Wrath and we're dealing with Ascended Evancar. He's the first legend that we're going to take a look at in just a quick sec. We've got more cards with the 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 free way to play them or the alternative casting cost we've got spell shapers where we discard a card to get an effect stapled to a creature and we've got rebels and mercenaries which were prolific cards in standard at the time and rebels was everywhere and lin civi was banned in standard or some jazz like that i don't know i think that on episode five of commander cookout we featured a mono white rebels deck which is fine but they're not very prolific in commander i am more interested in some of the free spells some of the artifacts and a couple of the lands that were in nemesis and that's what we're going to look at just after we talk about the legendary creatures so first up like i mentioned ascendant evan car is a 3-3 vampire for black black four it's got flying other black creatures get plus one plus one that is all other black creatures remember that if you're playing this i've seen this Helma deck. I've seen this in Edgar Markov decks where it is one of the plethora of vampires that'll trigger more vampires that are black from Edgar Markov's eminence ability. So they all get buffed and then non-black creatures get minus one, minus one. So you've got to be careful a little bit with those mono red or mono white vampires in your Edgar deck if you are playing this. So just something to think about. And remember, if a vampire is both black and another color, it will get both plus one and minus one, so it will just be whatever it is. So cool card, but six drop. I don't know if the Edgar Markov plays many six drops anymore. It's it's a pretty tuned list. That list is fairly established and it is fairly good. But this could be fine in a in a casual vampire deck. So it's a cool card. It's Krovax. He was like the main boss of Wrath. So cool guy. Bad guy though. Bad guy. Next up, Lynn Civy. She was one of the rebels in the set and all rebels had this ability where you could pay some amount of mana and you search for a rebel with converted mana cost of less than the number of mana you spent like if you paid four and tapped the rebel you could search for another three drop rebel and put it onto the battlefield well lin civi was unique in that you could pay x and search for something with less than x converted mana cost put it onto the battlefield you could also just pay three and you could put a rebel card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. Now, there was no tap involved. So if you paid three, put it on the bottom, then you could then tap and pay X and you could find that rebel and put it onto the battlefield. So she gave you a continuous stream of rebels over and over and over and over again and you couldn't beat it. You could not beat this card and this rebel deck. And she is 
white, white one for a one three. So she blocked, she blocked opposing one and two power things and you just couldn't beat it. But in commander, I don't know. It's, it's not only is it mono white, it's rebels and there's not that many of them. So last commander in the set, we have got Volrath. The fall on a six four for black 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 three. You can play. You can pay black one. Discard a creature card from your hand. Volrath the Fallen gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the discarded card's converted mana cost. So I've actually built this deck, and it was full of Platinum Empyreans and Eldrazi and Dark Steel and Blight Steel because you can discard like a ten or twelve drop to make Volrath a sixteen power dude, and he just crashes in. Any pump effects you have or any black anthem effects like the Ascended Evancar, whom you could discard to give Volrath plus six plus six, allows you to just beat face. I played a Kuro Pit Lord, so you could Kuro Pit Lord, you could discard that to Volrath to give Volrath plus nine plus nine. So he's got 15 power. Then you could reanimate your Kuro Pit Lord, and he's got like pay pay one life to give minus one minus one to a creature and you just pay like 20 life and kill all your opponent's creatures all their blockers and you just crash in for 15 so it was a cool deck big big uh big black mana base right with the cabal coffers the urborg and the the untapped target land land and cabal stronghold it was all there but ultimately this is a little bit of a trick deck i call them where they have the 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 one trick that they do they're a one trick pony and once you and your play group you are kind of tired of it and or your play group has wised up to all they need to do is hold up removal for your commander it kind of loses its favor a little bit so it was a good it was a good exercise in deck building and doing black things but after a while i just took it apart because i never played it that's fine though moving on to the rest of the set honestly not a whole ton of commander cards here but i would like to highlight some that i've seen played or that i think are maybe a little bit of a hidden gem there's a cycle of seals they are like enchantments that you sacrifice to get some effect like a seal of cleansing you play it and it just sits there and it doesn't do anything until you sacrifice it to destroy target artifact or enchantment there's a shock like this it deals two damage in red there's a plus three plus three in green there's a destroy target non-black creature in black and the blue one was i don't even know when i when i find it i'll tell you but the blue one i don't remember being as being very good there's a cycle of parallax cards they had fading and fading is an ability I think that's unique to Nemesis or was unveiled in Nemesis where during your upkeep, you remove a fade counter. They come in with some amount of fade counters and you remove one each upkeep. When you cannot remove one any longer, you sacrifice a permanent. So Parallax Wave is the first instance of this where you can pay white, white, two. It's an enchantment, just sits in play. You can remove a fade counter and exile a creature. And when it eventually has the last fade counter removed, you bring back all of the cards that were exiled this way. If you can proliferate this multiple times in a turn, you can just exile stuff willy nilly, kind of O-ring style that's repeatable, right? There are ways to make it a creature like with opalescence and then you like bounce itself. And when it bounces, it brings back like the stuff. I, I don't remember that. I know that there's combos. You could, you could Google parallax wave combos or parallax tide combos. Tide was the blue one. I believe that it bounced instead of exiled. So cool cards. You got to sort of build around them, but there's spiritual asylum and another enchantment for white, white two creatures and lands you control have shroud. But whenever a creature you control attacks, you have to sacrifice Spiritual Asylum. So if you're in a deck that doesn't want to attack, let's say like my Persistent Petitioner's deck, this might be a good card. There's Daze. I've been blown up by a Daze. This is blue one, but you can return an island you control to your hand instead of paying its mana cost, and it counters a spell unless its controller pays one. Oh, so I've gotten Dazed hard cast before, and it's just a blowout, and it's just hilarious. It's kind of just a trolley card, like Mana Leak or Cancel or whatever. Parallax Tide. I just I just mentioned Parallax Wave. Tide is the blue one, and it exiles land. So you can exile a bunch of land, then you could Armageddon, and then when you remove your last fade encounter from Parallax Tide, all your land come back in, effectively negating the Armageddon. So there's little tricks like that that you can do 
with with uh, the parallax cards. There's a Stax card in Rising Water. It keeps mana tapped. Seal of Removal was the blue one, and it returned target creature to its owner's hand. So that was a boomerang on an enchantment. So super cool. There was creature tutors in Sea Hunter and Mog Catcher, and then there was uh, there was one for an elf. So these were relevant creature types to the standard environment, like. Sea Hunter is a mercenary, but it searches your library for a merfolk and puts it onto the battlefield for three and tap. So the Mog Catcher was like a human, but it searches for goblins or something. We'll get to it and I'll tell you what it was. Seal of Doom was the Black Seal. I'm only mentioning these because Enchantress players are going to know what these are, but maybe you have some other reason to run them outside of Enchantress. Or if you want it to be super unique and build like a Black Enchantress deck, that probably exists like a... Like a Daxos, the return, like the black white zombie guy, that might want a Seal of Doom in that deck. I'm looking at a card that I used to play in my mono red Zata deck called Downhill Charge. This is one of those free spells. So it costs red two for an instant. Target creature gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is the number of mountains you control. But you can sacrifice a mountain instead of paying downhill charge's mana cost. So what I would do is tap out of course make a whole bunch of tokens give all my creatures haste all my goblin tokens and all my zero drop cards in my zada deck haste then i would just sack a mountain when they think i'm tapped out and maybe i have five or six mountains remaining on the battlefield target zada and she radiates the spell to target all of my other tokens that now get plus six plus oh until end of turn and because i put cards into the deck that gave them haste instead of attacking for maybe you know, seven or eight, I'm attacking for like 80 because I've got, you know, 10, 10 tokens, 12 tokens that all get plus six or seven or whatever. So it was a cool card. Flame Rift is another one. It's like a Punisher deck. I see this in Rakdos decks all the time. It's a sorcery for black or sorry for red one. Then it deals four damage to each player. So that was a cool one. It's lots of damage for two mana. Mog Catcher was another mercenary. I think they maybe they're all mercenaries that that search for some relevant creature type. Red, red, two for a two, two. You can pay three, search your library for a goblin, put it onto the battlefield. So that was what they all did. I suppose that is the mercenary and rebel thing that they did back in in the day. Get this one. This one probably has a has a place somewhere in Commander. This is called Sky Shroud Behemoth. This is a 10-10 for red, red, 5. So a 10-10 for 7. Enters the battlefield tapped. Okay. Fading 2. So it enters the battlefield, 2 counters, tapped. Your next turn, you untap it, remove a fade counter. So it has 1 fade counter, you can swing for 10. And then the next turn, you remove a fade counter, it's got 0, you can swing for 10. On your next turn, you cannot remove a fade counter because there's none left. It would die. So essentially, you get two swings with this unless you can untap it or proliferate it. Or if for whatever reason, you want a 10-10 in your deck or a 10-10 for 7 in your deck. Reanimation, fling, something that cares about how much power a creature has or how much toughness a creature has. Something like Overwhelming Stampede, something like that. There's got to be a place for that card in Commander somewhere. Next green card, Sky Shroud Claim. This was the original set that it was in. For green and three, you search your library for two forest cards, put them into play. That is forest, so you can get dual lands, and into play, not tapped. I think that this is the gold standard for four mana, get two forests, that everything else should be held to. If you're playing Explosive Vegetation, Mm, I don't think that that's as good, provided you have lands that have forest and something else in their color type. So shout out to Dana Roach for that one. I know that he's a Sky Shroud claim player instead of something like Explosive Vegetation. Moving on to artifacts, I like a little guy called Belby's Portal. This is an artifact for five. Enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. You can pay three, tap it, put a creature of the chosen type from your hand onto the battlefield. So this is just going to like flash in whatever creature type you want, which is super awesome. I don't know, maybe you name Construct and you get a Blight Steel or, or whatever creature type it is. Maybe you name Dragon, maybe you name Elemental or something big. You get an Avenger Zendikar a couple turns early. That's pretty cool. I like Kill Switch, which is an artifact for three. You could pay two and tap it. Tap all other artifacts. They don't untap during their controller's untap. 
tap step as long as kill switch remains tapped. So you keep everybody's stuff tapped. On your turn, you untap your kill switch and then you tap it again immediately and nobody's stuff ever untaps. So that's kind of a cool one. We've got Predator Flagship. This was the opposing sky ship. This is the antagonist to the Weatherlight sky ship. And this one is a legendary artifact for five and you can pay two to give target creature flying until end of turn. Okay, cool. Kind of acts as a kind of like an equipment, but it's not an equipment. You can pay five and tap it to destroy target creature with flying. It's interesting. The whole story is about the Weatherlight and the Weatherlight crew. And then we got Predator flagship first. We didn't get Weatherlight until Plane Shift set, which was three sets from now in a different block. So interesting. I don't know. They gave us this one before Weatherlight. I always thought that that was weird. Last couple cards, last artifact, we got Tangle Wire. This is a CCO Brando staple. And it's got Fading Four. It's an artifact for three. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player taps an untapped artifact, creature, or land for each fade counter on Tangle Wire. Whew. So you untap, and let's say Tangle Wire has three or four fade counters. You untap everything, and then you have to choose and tap creatures, artifacts, or lands for each fade counter. And in stacks decks, maybe like with Atraxa at the helm, they play their tangle wire and they just proliferate it every turn so every turn you have to tap four things tap four things tap four things it's that's a nightmare card to play against there's three land in this set i'm going to cover them all quickly first one core haven gives you colorless white and one you tap it prevent all combat damage that would be dealt by target attacking creature this turn so it's kind of like a sort of a fixed maze of it except it doesn't untap the creature just prevents damage Next one, Terrain Generator. Taps for colorless. You can pay two, tap it, put a basic land from your hand onto the battlefield. This is sort of like ramp in colors that don't have access to it. I like this in white decks. I like this in red decks that care about maybe destroying or sacrificing their own land. I like Terrain Generator. The final one, I have not lost one game, but two games to this card, Wrath's Edge. Taps to give you colorless, or you can pay four. Tap, sack a land. Wrath's Edge deals one damage to target creature or player. Yep, multiple times I've lost to that card. <sighs> being at one or being at two and just getting two activations off of that. Got me, got me. And that's it. That is Nemesis in a nutshell. Again, not a whole ton of great stuff for Commander, but there's some gems in there and there is some you know, niche strategy cards, and there are some combo potential in those parallax cards. So if you have any of your own nemesis hidden gems, hit me up on Twitter, at CadPopCast, and of course, Commander Ad Populum on Facebook. If you're part of the Commander Ad Populum Patreon and Discord family, shoot them over there. And again, I encourage you to go to patreon.com slash cadpopcast to check out some of the benefits. There are benefits for my altered art card business. If you're into any of that, there are discounts and options to receive first crack at, at cards that I sell on Twitter or what have you. Big thank you to everybody that supports me on Patreon. I couldn't do it without you guys. Also, big thank you to FusionGamingOnline.com. They are there for all of your nemesis needs, all of your Marcadian Masks needs. Great place to be. And I imagine they're going to have some kind Christmas deal or Boxing Day deal. So keep an eye out there. Make sure you tell them that Ryan from Commander Ad Populum sent you. That helps me out a lot. Until then, everybody. Make sure to check out the links for Collective Voyage. That is allhailbolus.tumblr.com. And of course, Cure for the Common Game, Brian. He was gracious enough to send me a long message, as was Anton from Collective Voyage. Super appreciate when people reach out because they always seem to send me things that seem like good additions to the Magic and the Commander community. So thank you to everybody. Keep all of the content, suggestions, encouragement coming. Have a good holiday season remember to partake responsibly or safely no drinking and driving nothing like that remember to give back there is always people who are less fortunate than you and until then everybody i will see you next wednesday